have a bunch of stuff for today. How exciting. Thank you. Um, so let's start with our centering before we get into our lots of stuff. Just get yourself settled. You can start this when you first come in and get yourself ready. So as usual, we can begin with our breathing. Make sure your feet are flat on the floor. Either cast your eyes down or close them, whatever works best for you. And I want you to become aware of your body, your physical body. It's a big task. But the overarching idea is that every molecule in your body existed someplace else. Every molecule existed someplace else before it was part of you. Every water molecule in your blood came into your body in the form of something that you ate or drank. Picture yourself sipping a cup of tea. While it's in your cup, it is not your body. Then you drink, and now some of that water becomes part of your body, part of your blood. Even before the water was part of your tea, it existed for a long time in other places. It has been rain and rivers and oceans and clouds as it moved through the water cycle. Now it has become an essential part of you for some period of time, depending where it is in your body. As you breathe in and out, recognize that every molecule in your body has been soil or stone or sea. Your body is made entirely of elements that have been other things and will be other things again. You may experience a deep revelation that you are not separate or cut off from the rest of nature. So that's what we're moving toward today, understanding how that connection happens. Uh, we have a whole bunch of announcements this morning. Um, I'd like to bring your attention to the first extra credit movie is going to happen on Wednesday, September 14th, so a week from today. The dates for those extra credit movies are listed in your journal, uh, actually in the syllabus, so you can find those there. In order to get the extra credit, you can get up to five points of extra credit for attending up to five movies. Um, and in order to do that, you show up on time, you sign in with the learning coordinator that's coordinating those, that's uh, Izzy. So you'll meet Izzy at the movie, and then you watch the movie and you join in the discussion afterward. And then there's a reflection page in the back of your journal. So for this first movie, the reflection page is number 174 there, or excuse me, 147 in the back of your journal. There's a page for each of the five movies there. So then you'll, you know, you'll write a bit about what you came away with. When you look, watch, I'm sure many of you have seen Moana, but what if you look at Moana, watch Moana through the eyes of your new, this Baisai lens. Um, so that's what, the movies will be very different each time, different experiences different conversations, so I encourage you to take part in those. Um, there's, also, um, there's also this experience that's an opportunity for you, spending an entire semester at Shavers Creek. We call it the seed semester. It's an immersive semester where you do classes there on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Uh, if you're curious about this, I sent out this flyer, which I understand is not readable in this format, but I sent it out to you as a Canvas announcement along with the contact of the person that you will be, um, that you'll be meeting up with. 
There is an informational meeting coming up. I included that information in the announcement. So that's there for you. I also sent out a, a, an announcement about the sustainability events that are coming up, if that interests you. Um, there are several of those happening this week and will continue through the semester. So I'll keep you apprised of those for those of you who are curious about that. Also, outdoor school. Um, the deadline is coming, and so I sent you an announcement about that. Uh, but then here, Elizabeth is going to... Hi. Okay. Um, I'm Elizabeth, and I had done outdoor school all last year, uh, fall and spring semester, and I just applied for this semester again. Um, sorry, I'm so out of breath. Um, outdoor school was a phenomenal experience. I had literally the best time there because you get a whole week away in the wilderness, no technology, no stress about school, no stress about personal life, and you get to hang out and be a kid with kids for five days. Isn't that so exciting? It was so exciting for me. Um, and I met a lot of really cool people from that experience that are still my friends to this day. And um, as someone studying environmental education, like this opportunity was really, really good for me. And I think it's really, really good for all of you, especially that want to do education or something environmentally. Um, it's just a really good time. If you have any questions, please reach out to me or somebody else that's done this before. I've also did SEED last semester, best time of my entire existence. Um, I would love to answer any questions that you have about it. It was definitely um, a really unique, but really fun um, and amazing experience. So yeah. Thank you. All right. And the final announcement is uh, the pack back part of this course. I noticed that many, we're missing many submissions um, from pack back. So if you're having questions or if you're struggling, please reach out to me or you can reach out to the help desk at packback, help at packback.co um, to make sure that you're getting those, those submissions, those reflections in um, for our what is water question. I really appreciated what many of you wrote. I read lots of the what is water responses and I love how you are um, diving into the power of reflection. And so yes, water is H2O. And yes, water is part of everything, but what else is it? You know, when we think about water, water as a teacher, if I had a jar of water and shook it up and then it settled, how can I spend more of my existence being like water, settling so quickly, absorbing the world around me, being part? So lots of different ways to reflect on that question. And it was really fun to watch you reflecting and then also responding to your peers about that. So thank you for, for doing that. Again, if though, if you're having challenges, um, let me know or let somebody know, your TA or PACBAC, we're here to support you in that, so. So let's get started where we are today with this question. What's an example of a story you told yourself today? By going through this, we're going to work on what I am using, how I am defining the word story throughout this class. You're going to hear me use that story word a lot. And I want to define that. So what's an example of a story you told yourself today? So when I use that question, story means a way of seeing a belief or a truth. Okay, so it, it's, you know, your way of seeing the world or seeing a situation, and then it becomes a belief, something that we have going on in our head, and then it somehow lives our way, it lives its way into becoming our truth. So here are some examples. My son Henry says, Luke made me angry. Luke's his little brother. Happens a lot. Luke made me angry. That's Henry's story. Can Luke make Henry angry? No. Henry is choosing to be angry about something that Luke did. Luke, or Henry is choosing to react that way, and that's becoming his truth. I have to be angry because Luke did this thing to me. Okay. Here's another one. I don't have time for breakfast. 
that becomes our truth. It becomes a story, or it starts as a story that then becomes a belief, which then becomes a truth. Some of you may have experienced this this morning. I don't have time for breakfast. Well, actually, each of us had the same number of hours today, and you just chose to use your time differently. So that, that story of not having time um, is just a story. It can shift. It can change. I have to do my homework. No, you don't. It's your choice whether you do your homework or not. Of course, if you don't do it, there are consequences, but then maybe the consequences are something that you can handle. You don't have to do anything. That becomes our story. So in all of these cases, there are underlying choice, which ties into where we were last Wednesday. The choices that we have can be empowering to us when we see them in a different way, when we shift our story. Our stories subconsciously affect us in lots of different ways. Between stimulus and response, there is a space, and in that space is our power to choose our response. And in our response lies our growth and our freedom. Viktor Frankl. He was a celebrated Austrian physicist and Holocaust survivor. He wrote a memoir in 1946 called Man's Search for Meaning. It's really a meditation on the gruesome experience of being in Auschwitz, the concentration camp, and what that taught him about the primary purpose of life. The idea that the quest for meaning the, those that survived sustained having that curiosity, that sense, that quest. He also said, everything can be taken from a man but one thing, the last of the human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. We are choosing our own destiny. We are choosing our story. So we're going to dive into stories today and some of the choices that we make. I'd like to open with this particular story. This is the story of Sky Woman falling onto Turtle Island. In the beginning, there was Sky World. And a woman that inhabited that world slipped and fell into, or rather through, the hole. She fell like a maple seed, pirouetting on the autumn breeze. A column of light streamed from the hole in Sky World, marking her path where only darkness had been before. It took her a long time to fall. In fear, or maybe in hope, she clutched a bundle tightly in her hand. Hurtling downward, she saw only darkness below. But in that emptiness, there were many eyes that were focused on her. There was that shaft of light, and there was that falling object, a mere dust mote in that beam of light. As it grew closer, they could see that it was a woman her long hair billowing behind as she spiraled toward them, her arms outstretched. The geese nodded to each other and rose from the water in a wave of goose music. She felt the beat of their wings as they flew beneath to break her fall. Far from the only home she had ever known, she caught her breath at the warm embrace of soft feathers as they gently carried her downward. And so it began. The geese could not hold the woman above the water for much longer, so they called to a council to decide what to do. Resting on their wings, she saw them all gather, the loons and the otters and the swans and the beavers, the fish of all kinds. And a great turtle floated in their midst and offered his back for her to rest upon. Gratefully, she stepped from the goose wings onto the dome of his shell. The others understood that she needed land for her home, and they discussed how they might serve her need. 
The deep divers among them had heard of mud at the bottom of the water, and they agreed to go find some. Loon dove first, but the distance was too far. And after a long while, he surfaced with nothing to show for his efforts. One by one, the other animals offered to help. Otter, beaver, sturgeon, but the depth, the darkness, and the pressures were too great for even the strongest of swimmers. They returned gasping for air with their heads ringing, and some didn't return at all. Soon, only little Muskrat was left, the weakest diver of all. He volunteered to go while the others looked on doubtfully. His small legs flailed as he worked his way downward, and he was gone a very long time. They waited and waited for him to return, fearing the worst for their relative, and eventually a stream of bubbles rose with the small, limp body of the muskrat. He had given his life to help aid this helpless human. But then the others noticed that his paw was tightly clenched, and when they opened it, there was a small handful of mud. Turtle said, here, put it on my back and I will hold it. Sky Woman bent and spread the mud with her hands across the shell of the turtle. Moved by the extraordinary gifts of the animals, she sang in thanksgiving and then began to dance, her feet caressing the earth. The land grew and grew as she danced her thanks from a dab of mud on turtle's back until the whole world was made. Not by Sky Woman alone, but from the alchemy of all of the animal's gifts, coupled together with her deep gratitude. Together they formed what we now know today as Turtle Island, our home. Like any good guest, remember that Sky Woman had not come empty-handed. The bundle was still clenched in her hand. As she toppled from the hole in Sky World, she reached out to grab onto the tree of life that grew there. In her grasp were the branches, fruits and seeds and all kinds of plants. These she scattered onto the new ground and carefully tended each one until the world turned from brown to green. Sunlight streamed through the hole in the Sky World, allowing the seeds to flourish, wild grasses, Flowers, trees, and medicines spread everywhere. And now the animals, too, had plenty to eat. Many came to live with her on Turtle Island. This is an origin story. It's a way of seeing. It's a belief. It's a truth. And it comes from the oral tradition of the Potawatomi Nation. They are the natives that live around the Great Lakes region here in the United States. It's told in this book by Robin Wall Kimmerer, Breeding Sweetgrass. This is a really beautiful book. Um, Robin Wall Kimmerer is a trained botanist. She is Dr. Robin Wall Kimmerer. She is a, so she is a trained botanist. She teaches at a university and she is a member of the citizen nation of the Potawatomi. And through that, she embraces the notion that plants and animals can be teachers. I like to imagine what it would be like if this was my story, if I grew up hearing this story so that I wouldn't have to read it to you, that I could just tell it. What if that was our creation story? What if that's what we believed about how the earth came to be? Other people, other earlier people, had relationship with the natural world and the wonder of their universe, especially with those phenomena that they could not rationally understand. To solve these mysteries, they created a great pantheon of gods and goddesses to explain everything that was beyond their understanding. Thunder and tides and earthquakes and volcanoes, inf infertility, plagues, and even love. So for the early Greeks, the ebb and flow of the ocean was attributed to the shifting moods of Poseidon. 
They didn't understand the pull of the moon and how that worked scientifically, so they had to explain it somehow. Poseidon was the natural way to do that. The seasonal change to winter was caused by the planet's sadness at Persephone's annual abduction into the underworld. For Romans, the volcanoes were believed to be the home of Vulcan, blacksmith to the gods, who worked in a giant forge beneath the mountain, causing flames to spew out of the chimney. The ancients invented these gods not to explain the mysteries of the planet, but also the mysteries of their own beings. In Greece, love was about being targeted by eros, and epidemics were explained as punishment sent by Apollo. So when these people experienced gaps in their understanding, they filled them with these stories. And we do that same thing. Countless stories fill those countless gaps. And yet, over the time, scientific knowledge increased, right? We now know, of course, Vulcan is not what makes volcanoes erupt not who makes volcanoes erupt. So as the science increased and people came to understand things more, these gods fell away. I doubt that there's anyone in this room that now understands that Vulcan is connected to volcanoes. Those stories fall away, but that takes energy. It takes a lot of effort to shift those big stories that we carry in our lives. Sometimes it's uncomfortable, too. So what about this story? In the beginning, Genesis creation story of both Christianity and Judaism. So I imagine many of you grew up with this story. A story that is created by humans that is said to be divinely inspired. Stories give meaning. If this is your story, or if you have a different creation story that you hold on to, consider for a moment how that story has shaped you and your beliefs and the way you act in the world. These stories have incredible meaning, right, that we hold on to. I looked up creation myth because myth is just another word for story. Um, and there were so many. Wikipedia, full of different creation stories to help people explain from all over the world different creation stories. I found it diff interesting to think about how many different stories they are and how they have shaped people's lives. This is Joan Chittister. She is a Benedictine nun. She is a native Pennsylvanian. She did her, Penn, her PhD here at Penn State. She has also been a, the co-chair of the Global Peace Initiative for Women. The story goes that she was making the choice to become a nun when she was 16, and she was listening to a speaker, and Joan Chittister asked, how do you know that God exists? How do you prove it? And the answer came back, you can't prove that it is true, but you can't prove that it isn't true either. And that's when she understood that belief is always a choice. So the Big Bang is a popular theory, the most popular scientific theory about how things came to be here. The universe we see is just the tip of the cosmic iceberg. Hundreds of billions of galaxies contained. Stars, planets, moons, all the visible light and other energies, radio waves and gamma rays and x-rays. Everything we've ever seen with our telescope amounts to 5% of what's in the universe. So there's this matter that we can see and then along with this normal matter, there is what's called dark matter, which can't be seen, but it's observed by its gravitational effects on the visible matter. Uh, 
this dark matter is said to be 27% of the universe, and that's what's pulling everything together. It's the gravitational pull of, that holds everything together. And then the 60 other, 68 other percent is of the energy, total energy of the universe, is dark energy. It's a mysterious force that's actually pushing the universe outward and causing everything to expand, get farther away from each other. So there's this tug of war between the dark matter and the dark energy. So there's so much that we don't understand yet. And so this Big Bang is just one of the most popular theories about that. 14 billion years ago, there's still background radiation that gives scientists clues and can age this sort of event. During the first 400,000 years following what they describe as this Big Bang, the universe existed as a dense, hot, opaque plasma, a particle soup of matter and energy that in its reactions, it caused light. These tiny quantum fluctuations cause light on this planet. So science explains that the first thing that happened was light, which is very similar to many of those creation stories. First, there was light. So sometimes religion is at odds with science, and yet sometimes maybe they work together. What if 14 billion years ago, God, in whatever form you believe, or other people believe, what happens if that's when they decided to show themselves as God? So thinking back to dualism, science and religion, can you hold more than two things at once? Is it beneficial for you to make the shift to both and in order to open up more fully So the science story of how we came to be here. Here it is, starting back here, this is what the, you know, the potential, what big bang. And then for all of these beginning years, 440, you know, then there's light. And then we get to all of this diversity, all of this dark energy is working. First stars about 400 million years ago or excuse me, about 400 million years into the process. So it was, an, it was an evolution, a change, a shift. So then Earth itself, I guess I should say this, bonding is at the heart of cosmos, that dark matter that's holding everything together. We are instantly, we are made of attraction, right? So what happened then? Earth coming to be here, some star science, supernova explosion, one of the most violent events regularly to occur in the universe. This, a star is a huge ball of hydrogen gas, and then it, um, it's compressed by gravity, and then it's fused into helium. And so all of this is happening. This is happening with our sun right now, right? Stars have a finite life, and then they die. Some of them with a small whimper, they kind of fizzle out, and then others with this huge bang. And that's how Earth came to be. So what happens when we think about ourselves? All of the hydrogen, all of the hydrogen that's in the universe was formed 14 billion years ago. No hydrogen has been formed since that time. It was only created in that primordial, like, flaring forth explosion. And it was hydrogen that gave rise to those galaxies and the first stars. So given that hydrogen, what is water? Hydrogen, H2, two H's in hydrogen, in water. That's all that there is. Right? All the water that is on Earth right now is all the water that there will ever be. There won't be more formed. So all the hot water in your water bottle right now is 14 billion years old. So how old are you? Right? What's the stuff of you? 
The Big Bang is in you. You are 75% water. Your brain is 80.5% water. Your bone is 13, et cetera, et cetera. Blood, 90% water. That's the hydrogen that was created in this huge beginning piece, right? I'd like you to take in this video. What is the most astounding fact you can share with us about the universe? The most astounding fact. The most astounding fact is the knowledge that the atoms that comprise life on Earth, the atoms that make up the human body, are traceable to the crucibles that cooked light elements into heavy elements in their core under extreme temperatures and pressures. These stars, the high mass ones among them, when unstable in their later years. They collapsed and then exploded, scattering their enriched guts across the galaxy. Guts made of carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and all the fundamental ingredients of life itself. These ingredients become part of gas clouds that condense, collapse, form the next generation of solar systems stars with orbiting planets and those planets now have the ingredients for life itself so that when i look up at the night sky and i know that yes we are part of this universe we are in this universe but perhaps more important than both of those facts is that the universe is in us when i reflect on that fact i look up Many people feel small because they're small and the universe is big, but I feel big because my atoms came from those stars. This is your biggest story. You are stardust. You are made of the same stuff as the universe. The universe is not a thing just out there. I am the universe in the form of Jen. I'm a compilation, compilation of universe bits. That makes me unique in my own Jen kind of way, even though there are a lot of Jens. I'm the only one of me. And you are the only one of you put together in the way that you are. Part of the universe. The universe is in us. So I'd like you to take time to talk to your neighbor right now. What's going on for you at this point?
I'd love to hear from some of you. What's happening for you right now? What are you thinking about? What are you feeling? Everything just feels slow. Like, this is like the third week of school. So, well, is it third week? Third week? <laughs> okay, it's third week of school. Uh, everything feels slow. Uh, uh, I just came back from, because um, I traveled, so I uh, just came back and everything just feel everything like in slow motion and taking everything in and things are not moving as fast as it did the first two weeks, so I guess we're just, I'm settling in, I guess, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. And so how has that shift been for you? And how does it relate to maybe the bigger picture? Um, the shift has been a little um, tough, if that makes sense. Uh, just getting adjusted to like getting back into the swing of things and um, dealing with new experiences and new challenges as me personally this has been a challenge for me like academically and personally uh i can't get into the details because it's my personal business but um the second part about being related to the biggest story i feel like it's been an extension to my story um like i said with the new challenges um being able to uh, adapt and change my way of thinking, the way I see about things. So I see it's more of an extension to my story, if that makes sense. Yeah, thank you, Ish. Yeah, uh, going back to this whole idea about like we're stardust and things like that, I don't know, I guess I can understand from a logical standpoint how you're saying like nothing, like everything that's been, that's in existence has already, has already like been created. But I don't know, I think kind of taking a step back, like this whole idea that like I'm this like special part of the universe, I don't know, it just kind of feels like a cope. Like I don't feel like I can fully like immerse myself in that and this whole idea that, I don't know, my life is like one huge story. It doesn't, I don't know, I think I take more of like that whole like Camus absurdism take on it where it's just kind of like nothing really coincides with one another. Mm -hmm. So can you say a little bit more about that so that I understand a bit more about your perspective? Like the I idea of absurdism? Or? Yeah. So the idea of absurdism is basically it's not like predetermination or free will. It's kind of like the whole idea is that like your life matters because there's absolutely no purpose to it. So in order for it to have meaning, you have to kind of like create that meaning and embrace it. And I think that's kind of what I align with more. Which is exactly creating your story, right? Yeah. So you're the, you're the empowered one. You get to create your create your story. Yeah. And if I'm not getting the full message, you let me know. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Thanks for sharing. Other thoughts? So I was thinking about what it meant to me to choose to feel a certain way. Um, I've been around people in my life that have told me that they just choose to be happy and I always find that to be kind of absurd. Because to me, I think, well, that's just avoiding the issue. Um, but what we're talking about today, it actually kind of makes more sense to me now that what you're choosing is going to affect not just today, but how you view the world and what you see is happening and how you feel about each other. And it's actually kind of 
nice to think about it that way, <laughs> rather than just to decide to make a decision that um, feels right in the moment, but then might feel wrong later. Mm. Thanks for sharing. Good fodder for reflection. Any other thoughts about this? Feelings? Okay. So what you choose to believe about your origin profoundly affects your understanding of who you are and why you're here. You might want to write that down. It might help with some reflections later. So for instance, well, I read Sky Woman Falling, I can't help but wonder how different our society would be if we all were raised with an origin story that hinges on gratitude and interdependence. What would happen if we see that we are connected to every other living thing? If we all knew our sacred responsibility that flows between humans and Earth. Different stories affect us in different ways, as deep beliefs. Our stories are constantly shifting. That's part of the learning, unlearning cycle. I was with a dear friend of mine yesterday, he's 75, and he's somebody who's constantly reading and constantly understanding and asking questions, it goes back to that curiosity thing. He is the most curious person I have ever met. Um, and yet he gets tangled up in his head. He's putting a lot of energy toward learning and unlearning and relearning, whether that's religious beliefs or science beliefs or society beliefs or culture. We, it does take energy. So those Roman gods that we talked about er, earlier, to shift from those stories to something else takes sometimes a big jump, right? And big jumps take a lot of energy. Brian Swim said, take hydrogen gas, leave it alone for 14 billion years, and it becomes rose bushes, giraffes, and Mozart symphonies. The stories are constantly shifting. I'd like you to take in this short video, and then I'll give you your pack back question for this week. Regular incidences of awe leave residual benefits upon the individual that persist, such as increased feelings of empathy and compassion towards others, increased feelings of altruism, and increased feelings of general well-being. In this study, 
They defined awe as an experience of such perceptual expansion, such perceptual vastness, that you literally have to reconfigure, upgrade your mental schemata just to accommodate, just to take in the scale of the experience. This is amazing. We've all felt this before. The first time we stared upon the Grand Canyon or succumbed to the immersive power of an IMAX film. But perhaps the most exquisite account of the experience of awe was articulated by the brilliant Ross Anderson when writing about the Hubble Space Telescope. Pay attention. He says that the Hubble has given us nothing less than an ontological awakening, a forceful reckoning of what is, allowing us to contemplate space and time on a scale just shy of infinite. Why? He says gazing upon the famous deep field photograph literally allows us to mainline the whole of time through the optic nerve. To fit something so impossibly large to something so impossibly small. It's incredible. He says through the sheer aesthetic force of its discoveries, the Hubble distills the impossibly complex abstractions of astrophysics into these singular expressions of color and light, vindicating Keith's famous couplet, beauty is truth, truth, beauty. That overwhelming feeling of reverence, adoration, admiration, fear, produced by something grand, sublime, and extremely powerful. So I want you to reflect today on your pack pack question. When do you feel awe? Thank you very much. I hope you have a good week.